This story takes place in Brazil. I was in sixth grade when the class was discussing and sharing our own personal horror stories. None of us really had anything interesting to share, or in the very least, had our own reasons not to share them. Our science teacher at the time was correcting some tests and allowed our conversation to flourish. At one point, the talk changed from ghost stories to monster encounters. That's when my teacher looked up from her work. The expression on her face was a dead giveaway. She had a story to tell. Do you have a story, Teach? One of us asked. She nodded, and the whole class grew quiet and turned to her, moving our chairs closer, not wanting to miss a detail of it. It was rare for a teacher to share personal stories, much less a scary one. This happened to a friend of mine, Anna. Poor woman. I don't know how she didn't have a heart attack. I'd have. The teacher made the sign of the cross before proceeding. Anna used to work at a textile factory, or shop. I don't recall which. She loved to sew, but this wasn't what she had in mind when she applied for work there. She sewed her life away over that place, working from early in the day to late into the night. I kept telling her she could do better. She was a very talented dressmaker, and her boss wouldn't let her do anything but hammocks all day. She cleared her throat and stood up, trying her best to play off her rage and to focus more again on the story. Anyways, she worked until so late into the night that she had to almost always run to get the last bus leaving Teresina back to the little village that she lived in. The alternative was to walk home for hours in the pitch black dirty roads, and since she had to wake up early, that was never a viable option. That night she got on the bus as usual, paying for the ticket and moving through the ticket gate to the back, sitting right next to the ticket collector, since they were neighbors, and always talked about their day on the way back home. Like most nights, the bus was almost empty. No one but the driver was in the front part of the bus, and just a couple of very tired-looking workers were sitting in the back, catching up on some sleep. At this point, my teacher cleared her throat again, leaning against her table, becoming clearly uncomfortable as she continued the story. Since that dirty road had no houses along it, only some farms here and there, there was just a couple of stops, and the bus itself was the only source of light for miles in any direction. Usually, the driver never bothered to stop at the stops, since there was never a living soul out. He just rushed towards the village, moving about 40 kilometers per hour. But that night was different. The teacher shifted her weight again and rubbed her arms, covered in goosebumps. Her face wasn't her usual stern and collected expression, and she didn't appear excited to keep telling the story. The driver slowed down and stopped in the middle of nowhere. He then activated the little lever that opened the front doors. Anna thought for a moment they had already arrived. The collector looked over to the driver and asked why he had stopped. There was someone there, signaling the bus down, but I can't see them anymore, he said. It probably was just the wind moving some branches around, the collector replied. Branches of what? There aren't any trees around here, he argued. She shrugged. Well, he started to speed back up, leaving the bus doors open to ventilate the bus on the warm night. Not even half a minute had passed when a blood-curdling scream came from the vegetation outside and something collided at top speed against the right side of the bus, smashing it in. The bus's engine shrieked, and the brakes once again stopped the vehicle. The men in the back were awake again, and the driver was breathing heavily. They all remained silent for what felt like an eternity. They were all in total shock. The faint sound of something sharp moving against metal could be heard, accompanied by the foulest smell Anna has ever had the displeasure to smell. Rotten eggs, trash, and decomposing meat under the noon sun. That's how it smelled to her. Oh my God! The driver screamed, jumping out of his seat and crawling over the ticket gate in a panic. He pulled the collector out of her seat as well. The bus shook and the smell intensified when it climbed into the bus. Everyone pressed themselves against the back of the bus, watching horror while the monstrous horns and the demonic glowing eyes came into view. At this point, my classmates and I were all so close together that I could feel many of them shaking. My teacher didn't look any better than us almost whispering instead of talking in a normal tone. She continued. It was massive, well over two meters tall, and his horns made him look even bigger than that. 
His upper body was muscular, and his skin was very dark. His fingers had long, sharp-looking black claws, and the rest of his body was a disgusting mash of goat and man. Hairy, powerful legs on top of split hooves. And his face. My God, that face. He was smiling. A huge, terrifying smile, showing all of his crooked, rotten teeth. His glowing yellow eyes moved over everyone, looking deeply into everyone's eyes, enjoying their terror. He looked down on the floor of the bus where the driver had apparently soiled himself, and giggled in a screechy, deformed voice. Then the monster moved towards them, extending his long arms, but stopped at the ticket gate. Initially, he tried to move through it like anyone would, but he couldn't. His broad physique wouldn't allow it. Then annoyed, he tried to climb over, but got stuck on it. My teacher raised her eyebrows in disbelief, while some of my classmates laughed nervously. That thing tried to bend the metal rods of the bus, making space for his muscular physique, which wasn't enough for it to pass. Huffing and puffing furiously, he stretched his arms, clawing the air, trying to reach the people on the back of the bus. But this also failed. His monstrous gaze turned to the back doors, and a huge grin spread across his face. It pulled itself free from the ticket gate and dashed out of the front door. The collector looked over to the windows and saw the goat head quickly moving along them, while the sound of his claws scratching the paint off of the bus filled everyone's ears. She pushed the driver towards the front while the passengers started to scream. Finally reacting to the situation, the driver once again jumped over the ticket gate and back into his seat, moving the lever to the off position, closing the front doors and hitting the gas. The monster's fingers forced themselves through the crack at the back of the doors while the bus picked up pace. It once again let out a terrifying screech and ran alongside the vehicle, keeping up with it. Everyone was screaming at each other and at the driver to go faster. This Lada Velha can't go any faster than this, he shouted. The creature continued to follow the bus for a while, to the passenger's dismay, but eventually it let them go, letting out one last haunting howl. The classroom was completely silent, and many of us, including myself, were a bit shaky. I asked the teacher what happened to them after that. They lived, of course. I wouldn't know about this if Anna had been eaten by that demon. No, I mean like, didn't they call the cops or something? Didn't anyone take any pictures of the damaged bus or anything like that? She shook her head. That happened in the early 90s, in the middle of nowhere. And it isn't like they could have done it anyway. I don't even know if the village they lived in had a police station. But besides from that, apparently the collector told her that the company threw the bus in a junkyard because it was already old and not worth repairing it. But Anna doesn't know much more than that, especially since she and her family moved away to Picos after that. After a long silence, we asked her what she thought it was. I don't know. Maybe the devil himself. Maybe something else. To be honest, I hope I'll never find out. On October 11th, 1775, the Herald, a whale ship from Greenland, spotted a ship floating the icebergs about three miles from them. As they sailed closer, they noticed the threadbare sails of a three-mast schooner hanging limp. A coat of ice covered most of her. There were, at this point, no signs of life on the quiet, tattered vessel. Captain Warren urged his crew to take the Herald closer, and he called out to anyone on board, but received no reply. Captain Warren ordered his crew to accompany him on the ship, and even though many of his crew were too unnerved to board the Erie ship, eight men joined him on his quest. Captain Warren noted the ship's name, the Octavius, though he'd never heard of it before. As they boarded the desolate rig, still no signs of life showed themselves. The Octavius itself was weather-worn and decayed. The silence was enough to send the bravest of men back, yet Captain Warren pressed on. As they went below deck, they couldn't believe what they stumbled upon. 
nearly 30 men, all frozen to death. All of them appeared as if they tried to keep themselves warm until the very moment that the cold claimed their lives. All of them were preserved as if they had only been dead for a few days. In the captain's cabin, they found him at his desk, still sitting in his chair, pen still in hand. By this time, Captain Warren's men were letting superstition and fear take hold of them. They begged their captain to retreat back to the Herald, but he continued to search the ship. In another cabin, three more bodies were found. One of a woman lying in bed, another of a man sitting against a wall, flint and steel still in his hand. He died trying to make a fire to keep them warm. Next to him, under a sailor's jacket, lay the body of a little boy. Captain Warren's men were now on the verge of mutiny, and he had no choice but to go back to the Herald. He stopped at the frozen captain long enough to collect the logbook, though only the first page and the last few pages were present. Back on the Herald, Captain Warren watched until the Octavia sailed out of sight. Her frozen crew and tattered sails would never be encountered again. Warren retired to his quarters, eager to read the log of the Octavius. He found that the Octavius had set sail from England to China on September 10th, 1761, which was 14 years earlier. The last entry was dated November 11th, 1762. Captain Warren learned of the grim fate of the Octavius crew. They'd been trapped in ice for 17 days. Their fire had gone out and they tried without success to get it going again. The captain's son had died that morning and his wife was quickly succumbing to the harsh cold. The position given was longitude 160 west, latitude 75 north. Captain Warren reread the position, because what he was reading was impossible. That was thousands of miles from where they found her, and an entire continent of ice separated the two locations. It seems the ghost ship had managed to navigate the Northwest Passage on her own, without anyone at her helm. For hundreds of years, the almost impossible Northwest Passage claimed countless ships and their crews. It seemed to Captain Warren that the Octavius was another victim of the harsh elements. Only after the death of her entire crew and 13 years of sailing, the Octavius made the journey. On the island of Barbados in the West Indies, tales of unrest can be heard among the island's residents. In the graveyard of the Church of Christ sits a mausoleum known as the Chase Vault, and this was once the source of mystery and fear. The vault is made of carved stone, coral, and concrete walls over two feet thick. In July of 1807, Mrs. Thomasina Goddard was laid to rest. She was followed by Mary Anna Chase a year later in 1808, and four years later, the tomb was opened again to add the body of Dorcas Chase, Mariana's older sister, who had starved herself in an act of suicide. Four weeks later, Thomas Chase, the patriarch of the Chase family, also committed suicide. The day the tomb was opened to receive his body is the day things became unusual, because what they found were two coffins that were moved from their positions. The coffin of Mariana Chase was upside down in the corner and the coffin of Thomasina was pushed against the wall and standing on its side. Who would enter a mausoleum only to rearrange heavy lead coffins? To add to the mystery, if it were grave robbers, none of the lids had been pried open. The burial crew replaced the coffins, added Mr. Chase, and sealed the door again. The stone slab that sealed the mausoleum was so heavy it took six men to move it. On two more occasions, the tomb was opened again to add more members of the family, and on both of those occasions, the heavy lead coffins were moved around, even the coffin of Thomas Chase, which was 240 pounds. The vault was sealed with a stone slab again, and this time it was sealed with cement. Lord Cumbermere, governor of Barbados, had at this point heard about the tumbling coffins, and had grown concerned. On July 17, 1819, he insisted on being present for the burial of Thomasina Clark and watched as the cement seal around the slab was broken away and the slab moved out of the way. Lord Cumbermere was astonished. The coffins were all moved around again. 
Being a practical man, he decided vandals had to be responsible. He had the vault searched for any hidden entrances, but found none. He ordered that a layer of sand be spread inside the vault, and the vault was sealed with a heavy marble slab and cemented in place once again. He and four other men pressed their personal seals into the wet cement. Lord Cumbermere declared that should anyone intrude, the seals would be broken and the footprints would be left in the sand. Almost a year later, Lord Cumbermere let his curiosity get the best of him, and he visited the Chase Vault on April 18, 1820. He was accompanied by Reverend Thomas Ordison, who was the rector of the Church of Christ, and a handful of aides. The seals in the cement and the cement itself remained intact. The aides cracked away the cement and moved the marble slab away. When Lord Cumbermere looked inside, the sand was untouched. But to his horror, the vault was in chaos. One coffin was on the steps to the chamber, and all of the other coffins were upside down. The only coffin that remained where they had left it was Mrs. Goddard. Knowing no one could have entered the vault without breaking the seals or disturbing the sand, and still none of the coffin lids had been pried open, Lord Cumbermere gave up on his quest to solve the mystery. He ordered the coffins removed and buried in another cemetery. Ever since then, the mausoleum has remained empty. Theories were given one after another as to what could have caused the coffins to tumble. Could it have been an earthquake? Maybe. But no earthquakes had been reported, and no other vaults had coffins displaced. Could it have been flooding? Perhaps. But again, no other vaults were damaged and the sand in the vault was undisturbed. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had perhaps the only theory that wasn't so easily discredited. Perhaps the disturbances were the spirits of Dorcas and Thomas, two people that committed suicide, possibly creating two restless spirits that were unable to move on. My great granddaddy told this story to my daddy, who told it to me. I told my kids, and when they're old enough to have their own babies, they'll tell them too. Back then, my family lived in the swamps their whole lives. My granddaddy lived in the shack with his daddy and his mama and his brother and sister. The shack was small and only had two rooms, so all three of the kids shared one room. Granddaddy was 12 years old. That made him three years older than his sister and four years older than his baby brother. They was close as a family ought to be. They was bayou folk, Creole, never left the swamps. They hunted deer, wild pigs, lizards, gators, and fish, growed their own food, tended to their sick, and birthed their babies all at home. They didn't have a car, nothing. Just simple, God-fearing folk. One summer, they started hearing sounds when they was out hunting. They heard growls during the night. They'd get whiffs of stale blood and wet animal when they was out in the swamps. The dogs would start acting funny, uneasy, like they was scared. These were big, fearless dogs, and they wasn't scared of nothing. Never ever. You could say that the first encounter started there, with the growls and the smells and the dogs. But when they first seen something was when it really picked up. One night, they saw what looked like eyes looking in on them. Big, angry eyes. At the same time, the dogs was losing their minds. They'd go back and forth between whining and barking, scratching at the door to be let out, but then running and hiding under the beds. My great-granddaddy, whose name was Lester, done run outside with his rifle and fired a warning shot, chased whatever it was away from their shack. He was convinced it was another one of the Bayou people, just peeping in. Or maybe that it was his good friend Gene, who liked to joke around on people. He decided he was going to go talk to Gene the next day and see if it was him, just having a laugh at them. He said, I ain't his daddy, but I found out it was him, and I'm going to give him a whooping like I am. My great-grandmama, Sabine, hushed the youngsters that night, tucked them back into bed, told them that monsters ain't real and that God was watching over them. 
Of course, this was all to quiet their nerves. She did believe in monsters herself. And she was the first one to use the word Rougarou when talking about that night. Lester talked to Jean the next day. He swore with a handshake that it wasn't him at the window. This just confused Lester even more. The next thing that happened was the Rougarou killed one of the dogs, Rex. He was the biggest, meanest of all three. It ate him up. When my granddaddy found out what was left of Rex, he learned that the poor dog was torn apart, insides on the outside, head ripped right off. Now this dog fought with wild pigs and bears. He was strong and mean. Something got him though, and there wasn't much left of him. Lester blamed it on bears. There wasn't a lot of them, but some. And he was sure that it was a bear that got Rex. Sabine was sure that it was the Rougarou though. Lester hushed her. Rougarou's was superstition, and he didn't believe in fairy tale talk. Soon after that, rumors reached Jean's ears about a man that was from the swamps. He was found dead, ripped apart by a wild animal just like Rex. He told Lester. Sabine started talking to the Rougarou again and made them all pray for safety and for this beast to leave the swamp and go back to wherever it was it came from. Jean told them he was going to find out more. The next day, Jean walked to where the rumors started and talked to the people there. He learned a man named John was found dead. They told him no man or animal could have done what was done to John. He heard from them about the animals that was killed in their area. Deer, pigs, dogs, birds, all killed the same way. And he heard more about the Rougarou, the howls that come with it, and that they believed it was once a man. Jean come back and told them what he learned. Sabine wouldn't let the kids play outside alone anymore. They wasn't too happy about that. Life goes on though. Then one night, Lester and my granddaddy was hunting for wild pigs and it got dark on them. They was heading back when the dog started acting a fool and took off fast as hell towards the shack. They heard growls and then onto the path stepped out a monster on two legs, the Rougarou. Nine feet tall, black as black can be, claws that can tear the head off a man, and glowing yellow eyes. They stood there, staring at this creature for a long time, as it stared right back at them, snarling the whole time. When it roared at them, they backed away, and then they ran as fast as God let them, all the way back to the shack. There they found the dogs waiting on the porch, whining and growling. And they were with Sabine, who was clutching her rifle. They locked themselves inside, clutching their guns and the little ones, waiting, praying that it wouldn't come after them. Then the dogs went crazy again, and they heard a howl from something not of this earth. The Rougarou had followed them home. They listened to it growling and moving around outside all night long, but it never tried to come in. It just stalked the shack, as it did for the next three nights. It never came before sunset, and it was always gone before dawn. It would howl and growl, try to look inside the windows and sniff around. The dogs were on edge. They wouldn't eat. They'd just sit by Lester's side. Jean came to stay with them once he learned about their troubles. Said they needed his help, and that this Rougarou needed killing. Sabine agreed with Jean, and said unless the Rougarou was gone, they'd never be safe in their own home again. So the two of them set out the next morning, trying to find some clues as to where this Rougarou was hiding. Lester, Jean, and one of the dogs, looking for tracks or clumps of hair, anything that would tell them where the Rougarou was going to be. Well, my granddaddy, Sabine, and the other dog stayed back at the shack, protecting the youngins. They would look out the windows from time to time, 
seeing if there was any Rougarou trying to come at them while well, they comforted the little ones, making sure they felt safe and that they knew God would be protecting them no matter what. While well, Jean and Lester was out hunting, they didn't find anything. No tracks, no clumps of hair, no dens, no whiffs of any smell. It was as if this thing was a ghost, or that it was smart enough to cover its tracks. They hunted all day long, and come up empty-handed every single time they thought they might just have a trail. As the sun went low, they decided it was time to go back, barricade the doors, and wait out the night while this Rougarou tormented them, as it had the last three nights. But as they headed back, as fate would have it, the dog started to whimper, started to growl, just like it had every night the beast was near. Only this time, they had a rope tied around the dog's neck, acting as a leash so it couldn't run away like it did the last time. The dog tugged, trying to come home, trying to get free, and then they heard the growls. They heard the roar as this Rougarou stepped out of the cypress trees and made itself known once again. This time, as the sun was low, they could see the beast. Lester raised his rifle and took aim at him. Gene followed suit and raised his rifle as well. Lester fired, so did Jean, and they both swore for the rest of their lives, till their bodies gave out on them and they lay on their deathbeds. They know they both hit the Rougarou directly in its chest. Two shots, bang, bang, two hits to the chest, and the Rougarou didn't even flinch. All it did was bare its teeth and roar at them, a roar so loud they felt it in their chest felt it in their bones. They turned and ran quick as lightning back towards the shack, thinking the whole time that the Rougarou was given chase. But it did not. The Rougarou didn't come immediately to get its pound of flesh. Instead, it waited for the cover of darkness to come after them, when you could barely see a thing. There were no lights, only the moon and the stars lit up the outside. But see, my granddaddy knew this, and had lit a bonfire outside to give them light, just in case Lester and Jean never made it back. For what seemed like forever, they waited for this beast to come back at them, to attack the shack. And then the dog started acting a fool again, and they knew it was time for the final battle. They knew that after the night was over, Mankind would either survive and send this beast back to the depths of hell where it belongs, or this beast would collect its pound of flesh and add more victims to its list of chaos. When the Rougarou finally made itself known, it roared so loudly that the glass in the window shook. It shook their souls, shook their souls to their very foundations. The first thing the Rougarou did was smash out a window, and my granddaddy, was the first to open fire. He was closest and had seen it coming. Jean followed suit and took a shot and the Rougarou ran back into the shadows, hiding the cypress trees once more. Granddaddy and Jean reloaded. Lester and Sabine did not fire because they wanted to make sure that every bullet counted. They knew that it was going to take more than just a few bullets to send this monster back to hell. They knew that if this creature really was a monster from hell, that it would take everything they got to survive the night. So for hours, that's what happened. The Rougarou would run up and slam itself into the shack, almost knocking it off its foundation. And one or two of them would take a shot. Never ever more than two at once. You see, they never wanted to be caught without a loaded weapon. Two would fire and drive the Rougarou back while well, the other two would hold off, and then they would switch with the next attack, always saving ammo, always making sure that every single shot counted. They kept the young ones in the middle of the shack, away from the doors, away from the windows, away from anything that the Rougarou could smash through and snatch them up. The dogs would whine and bark at the same time. 
They would charge the door, but then they would run and hide back under the bed. It was as if that they too knew that this truly was the final battle. Finally, as the Rougarou charged again, my great-granddaddy yelled that it was coming. The Rougarou smashed through another window and Jean took a shot, hitting the monster in its face. The Rougarou roared in pain, and as if they had turned into one person, my granddaddy, his mama, and his daddy all fired too, each one believing that they too had hit the creature in its face. And each time it was hit, it bellowed in pain and rage. Then, once again, it ran back into the cypress trees. Only this time, it did not come back. And the last they ever heard of the Rougarou itself was one final howl. As if the creature was letting them know it was not dead. And one day, it would come back for revenge. That's the last time they ever saw the Rougarou. And all the people of the swamp set out to find its body set out to find the beast that was terrorizing them for so long. But the people were divided. Half of them were going out looking for a Rougarou, a wolf beast, a Creole werewolf, a monster that was nine feet tall, looking like a giant wolf walking around on two legs. While the other half were out looking for any missing man, woman, or child, because they truly believed that this Rougarou was once a person and if they could find a missing person, where no body could be found, they might just find out who the Rougarou was. Because if the Rougarou was slain, then the person it once was would have been slain as well. This story is the testimony of my great granddaddy, my granddaddy, my daddy, and now me. This is our family's legacy. We did fend off a Rougarou. Whether or not this thing truly died, or moved on, or gave up and lived off the land like the people of the swamp have always done, we may never ever know. But my friends, everything, every single detail that I have shared with you, I swear to you on the swamps and the land that we have owned for generations, is true. The Rougarou is out there, and it will come for you if you're not careful. Thank you, Supernaturalist for helping me shed light on this monster. Because as you have put it yourself, things really do go bump in the night. Thank you for listening to my family's story. And if these things ever do come out of the forest or out of the swamps, may God be with all of us. May he look over us and protect us. And if these things really are creatures from hell, then he is the only one that can save us. Amen. This encounter happened in September of 2008 during a camping trip I was taking with my cousin Michael. It happened up in Washington State, sometime in the middle of the night. I'm not really sure what time it was, but it was still pitch black outside when it happened. To start things off, my name is Jacob Berry and I live in Sacramento, California. I'm 42 years old now, but I was a young buck back then and ready to take on anything that came my way. That is, until that night which I will never forget myself. Even though I didn't actually witness this myself, I have talked with my cousin more times than I can count, and I'm confident that I can tell you his side of the story accurately. We used to go out and camp all the time when we were younger. He was the only member of my family my age. He was only a year older than me, and our moms are sisters. We lived down the street from each other, and we used to do everything together. We still do everything together, actually besides camping. He hasn't camped since that night. I don't even think he's been in the woods since we went back to get our stuff, come to think of it. We were camping out in our tent for three days, just goofing off, drinking beer, barbecuing, and shooting the breeze. We'd go down to the lake for a dip every day after a good hike, and then by nightfall, we'd sit around the fire until we got tired and hit the hay. That's exactly how it happened the day that changed how I look at things. By the time it happened, we were already in our tent and asleep. How I understand it is, Michael got up to take a leak and saw something he never thought was possible. I woke up to him screaming in terror and yelling like a crazy person. I woke up with a start, 
heard the commotion of my cousin, but I also heard something huge running through the brush away from us. This thing sounded like it weighed a few hundred pounds, easy. If I had to guess based on the commotion and the noise, I would say this thing actually topped 500 pounds. So I grabbed my 357 that I always take with me and jumped out of the tent. The door was already unzipped. I found my cousin babbling and in shock. I mean, this poor guy was shaking and trembling like a leaf in the windstorm. He had his flashlight and I had mine. I was spinning around, trying to get a good look in the direction that I heard this thing run off. I had my gun ready to shoot and everything. You see, I always kept my gun on me after I had an encounter with a black bear a couple of years before that. I never aimed to kill, only to scare off. But if push comes to shove, I wasn't laying down my life for a wild animal. I didn't see anything, but my cousin was downright terrified and kept telling me we needed to leave. Now, I wasn't about to take off in the middle of the night without a good reason, and I told him that. And then I told him he needed to tell me what the hell was going on. I noticed then that my cousin was actually so scared that he either pissed himself or got urine all over himself while he was carrying on about whatever he saw. Either way, there was piss all down the front of his pants. And yet he just kept babbling about needing to leave. And finally, he sputtered out that he saw a werewolf in our campsite. I chuckled at him, thinking he was funnin' around, but he looked me straight in the eyes and said this to me. Jake, I don't believe in werewolves, but I'm telling you, honest to God, I saw a werewolf coming up on me. The way he said it for some reason, and the fear that I saw in his eyes, actually made my hair stand on end. He was pleading to me to believe him, without asking me to believe him at all. It was all in his eyes. I'd never seen him like this in all our lives. I told him it had to be a bear, but he refused to believe that. We ended up going to the pickup, and he calmed down and drank some water, and I finally calmed him down enough to tell me the whole story. He told me he got up to pee, and while he was doing his business, he started hearing this heavy breathing sound behind him. He thought it was me at first, but when he turned to look, he saw this thing that looked just like a werewolf sneaking up on him. He told me it was on two legs and it was crouching down the way a man would when he's sneaking around. That's when he got scared and started yelling. He shined the flashlight at this thing and it blocked the light out of its eyes with its hands, just like a person would do. Then this werewolf or whatever it was, bared its teeth at him like it was pissed off. Then it growled at him and took off into the brush all the while, still on two legs. He said he'd never seen something move like that thing did. It was too fast to be real. He said he just kept on yelling because he thought that maybe he spooked that thing and wanted to make sure that it was gone. At this point, I still thought he encountered a bear and I told him so. But he started swearing at me and telling me that he wasn't an idiot and that he knew what he saw. You want me to describe it to you, he yelled out. The whole time he described it to me, he was looking out the windows. I guess he was trying to see if this werewolf was coming back or not. I wasn't too worried, since I still thought it was a bear, and didn't think it was going to come back and mess with us. He lit up a cigarette, didn't roll the window down, but I knew he was so scared he was just trying to calm his nerves, so I didn't say much about it. And then he described this thing to me from the tips of its ears all the way down to the toes. And this is exactly how he described this thing to me. Shaggy, with matted fur, medium brown in color, but with areas where the hair was darker brown and black at some points. He said the hair had bits of forest in it, like leaves and twigs, like it was sleeping on the ground. It had the head of a wolf, a black nose, big yellow teeth, and pink and black gums. The fur on its face was shorter, but it also looked like it had a mane of shaggy hair around the sides of its head. It had long pointed ears with black skin on the inside, and its eyes looked like a cat's, yellow with a vertical black slit. When the creature put its hands out to block up the light, it had fingers with joints just like a person. He said it looked like a hand, not a paw, and the palms had very short hair on them. 
He didn't get a good look at the lower half until it was running away, but he said it had a long, bushy tail and ran like a dog would on its toes. But of course, this thing was only on two legs. The lower half wasn't as shaggy as the top, but the fur was still long, like a German shepherd's hair. He looked at me and asked, Have you ever heard of a bear that looks like that? Or runs on two legs, Jacob? I can't say that I ever have, but I still didn't think it was a werewolf. But I'll let you know this. I didn't see this thing, but I'm 100% sure that I heard it. A couple of them, actually. It was about 30 minutes after all the commotion. We were still sitting there in the cab, but now Michael was mad at me and not talking because I couldn't give him an explanation of what else it was that he could have saw, and I refused to call it a werewolf. Then I heard the scariest, loudest, most out-of-this-world scream that I've ever heard. Now I've heard everything in God's beautiful wilderness that the United States has to offer. Bears, mountain lions, moose, even the dreaded party animal. But nothing, and I mean nothing, comes close to sounding like this. It was like a wolf's howl and a scream all rolled into one, but an unearthly scream, and it sent shivers right up and down my spine. Michael started getting antsy again at that point, and he kept on yelling about how it was going to come back for us. Now, these screams, or whatever they were, unnerved me to the point where I couldn't still admit that it was a werewolf, but I had to admit that something was going on in these woods that I couldn't explain, and I sure as hell didn't like it. So we decided to drive out of the woods that night and come back for our stuff the next morning. We were getting the essentials out of our tent when I heard the scream again. Nothing I know of could make that kind of noise. Then I heard another scream, off a little further than the first, and it sounded to me like the two of them were communicating to each other. It was definitely time to get the hell out of there, and Michael couldn't have been happier. We drove out slowly, since it was so dark. I was driving, and Michael had my gun in his hand. He kept right on talking about werewolves, and how this forest had werewolves, and how he'd seen an honest-to-God werewolf, and on and on. After hearing those screams, honestly, I wasn't too sure he hadn't seen a werewolf. Nothing makes those noises. Nothing besides horror movie monsters that up until that night, I thought were all make-believe. The next day, we went back for our stuff with another buddy of ours. Of course, we were all armed at that point. I told him about our little adventure the night before, and to my surprise, he told me this. There's some things out in these forests that you'd be surprised about. I didn't ask him to elaborate. I'd had enough of all the werewolf talk for the time being. When we got there, everything was mostly in order. Some chairs and our table were knocked over, but everything was accounted for. There was, however, the strongest odor of urine that I have ever smelled. It was absolutely horrible. I have smelled some seriously strong urine in my time working in a vet office, and I've smelled the urine of lions and tigers at the zoos that I've gone to, but nothing was as strong as this. In fact, it was so strong you could smell it inside your truck with the windows up before you even got there. It was almost enough to make me gag. Michael said the smell was worse where he peed the night before. Almost like something was marking over his urine or remarking its own territory. Michael thinks we stumbled into this thing's territory, and when he peed, it got pissed off and thought Michael was trying to mark that space as his own. Funny thing is, though, We'd been marking those trees for a few days and it didn't attack us until then. Why wait if that was the case? After that, my cousin became obsessed with werewolves. He's watched every werewolf movie he can find. He's even watched some in different languages and he just reads the subtitles. He has a book called The Werewolf Encyclopedia or something like that. He's obsessed. He also refuses to ever go back into the woods this was 12 years ago, and he hasn't been back there since. He thinks it was sneaking up on him to kill him, but when Michael noticed him, it got spooked and didn't want to waste that energy fighting him, so it ran away instead. 
As for me, I still don't know what's going on out there. I couldn't even begin to explain what happened out there. And it wasn't even until my wife's friend told me about something called a dog man did I even try to look into it. I pulled up some websites about it, and there was a link to YouTube stories, so I listened to some kid talking about them. Then I listened to a couple other people that I wasn't too sure I liked either. I found one fella and emailed him, but he wanted a live interview, and my cousin refused. Then I found you and emailed you. Now I'm on your show. I don't know what it was for sure that we encountered out there, but my cousin is certain it was either a werewolf or a dogman. I don't know. Based off those screams, something unnatural is out in those woods. And a lot of other woods around the world. Have a good night. Back in 1998, I was on a camping trip with my older brother. I was 34 at the time, and my brother was 36. We were with a group of four other people, consisting of my sister-in-law, two lifelong family friends, and my sister-in-law's best friend. We were up in Northern California and had been camping for three nights already before any weird shit started happening. We did the usual camping stuff, like hiking, nature watching, long talks around the campfire until all hours of the night, and of course, lots and lots of drinking. Growing up with a dad who was a complete outdoorsman, my brother, our two friends, and myself were always out in the woods, mostly around Mount Shasta, since that was my dad's favorite place to go camping. I'm not talking about campground camping either, although we did that when my mom or my aunt would tag along. I'm talking about out in the wilderness, no city lights, no toilets or showers, just the woods all around you. When the sun sets, you can see millions of stars, and when the campfire dies, you can't see more than 10 feet in front of you unless the moon is shining bright overhead. Real roughing and camping. I'm telling you this part because I want to stress how familiar with the woods I am. I'm completely comfortable in the woods and can identify the noises of the forest. I don't get spooked and there's nothing more relaxing than me going out into the woods on a four or five hour hike in the middle of nowhere. The morning of our fourth day there, we decided to go on another hike. The area we were in didn't have any trail markers, so we were basically trekking through the woods making our own trail. As we hiked, we started cracking open our MGDs and chatting about whatever came up. I think at this point we were arguing about whether it should have been Bruce Willis or Ben Affleck that died at the end of Armageddon. You know, stupid little stuff that people talk about when they're drinking and having fun. We hiked pretty deep into the thick of the trees, taking in all the sights and sounds as we went. It was just really peaceful and a fun time. At one point during our hike, our friend Terry stopped and pointed out this weird pile of sticks and grass and dirt. It definitely looked like someone had placed all of it there. I remember Terry and my brother commenting that it looked like someone was out there doing yard work and making a pile of debris to throw away later. We poked around it for a moment, but didn't really give two thoughts about it before taking off again. Not more than a minute or two later, we stopped again to examine this tree that looked like it had been snapped in half. This tree was at least as thick as my thigh, and it looked like someone had just grabbed it with both hands and snapped it in half like it was a stick. Amber, my sister-in-law, was the most curious of all of us and walked around it, looking at it with concerned eyes. What the hell do you think could have done this to that tree, she asked all of us. I shrugged at her, clueless as to what could have broken the tree like that. I offered up the idea of a bear, but she didn't seem too eager to accept that. Maybe it was Bigfoot, my brother joked. Amber and her friend Rachel both got a little annoyed and told them that wasn't funny, but Terry and her other friend Greg chimed in and started taunting the girls about how it probably was Bigfoot and they were going to be kidnapped by him in their sleep. The girls rolled their eyes, told them they were stupid, and we headed off to hike more. We hiked about another hour or so before stopping and hanging out for a bit, still enjoying a quiet day of alcohol and friends. Terry started to look around and I could actually see him shiver. It really, really creeped me out, and I asked him what was wrong. He said he just felt like someone or something was watching us, and we shouldn't be in the woods. He was quieter than usual, and that was even scarier than seeing him shiver, since usually he's about as serious as a stand-up comedian and rarely ever shuts his mouth. Amber and Rachel huffed at him and said the whole Bigfoot thing wasn't funny and they weren't in the mood for him to try to scare them. Terry just nodded and said he wasn't trying to scare them. 
Now officially unnerved by his attitude, we decided we should probably start hiking back. We packed up our stuff and headed in the direction we came. The hike back was normal, and Terry even seemed to forget about how creepy he was being and started joking around again. We passed by the tree that was broken, forgetting all about that too, and honestly, I don't even remember seeing it on our way back. We passed by the huge pile of vegetation, only kind of giving it any notice. On the way back, Greg nudged me and pointed out another of the broken trees. This one was even thicker. I shook my head at him, signaling that we shouldn't point it out to the others. I wasn't scared of anything out there, and I didn't believe that a hairy ape man was walking around in the middle of the woods in Northern California, or that we would even be unlucky enough to actually run into something like that, even if they were real. But I didn't want anyone else getting scared, so I motioned to Greg to keep it to ourselves. I just wanted to get back to camp, crack open some more beers, and have a good time, which is exactly what we did. We got back to camp, opened up another 12-pack of MGD, and started to prep for dinner a little bit later. Terry lit up a couple of joints, and we passed them around, except for my brother John, who was not into smoking pot at all. We grilled steaks that night and used the campfire to cook each of us an ear of corn and just enjoyed the quiet and beauty of the woods. After we cleaned up our dinner supplies and stuck the food back in our bear box, we settled in around the campfire to tell some scary stories. This was mine and my brother's idea, since we grew up with our dad always telling us these stories. We took turns trying to scare our friends until Amber stopped us and asked if we heard anything. I rolled my eyes at her and told her it was a nice try. She shushed me and said, no, I'm serious. We all stopped talking and listened, and that's when the six of us heard the most bone-chilling, heart-stopping noise you could ever think of. It sounded like a combination of a scream and a yell. It was long and deep. Terry and Amber started to freak out, but my brother kept them calm. And I realized I hadn't taken a breath since we started to listen to the noises, so I slowly started breathing again. Then the noise came again. My heart started pounding. What the hell was it? Could it really be a Sasquatch? It sounded pretty far away, but the noises were still as scary as hell. They lasted about 10 minutes, and some were long and some were short. It sounded like whatever it was was calling for another one. Amber, Rachel, and Terry actually ended up in the truck that night while Greg, my brother, and myself stayed out there to listen for any more of those noises. About an hour and a half later, they started again, but this time they were coming from the completely opposite direction. I started thinking about how screwed up it would be if it was another one and they met up with each other right where we were. I seriously don't think it could have covered that much ground in the amount of time that was had. But I'm not a Bigfoot expert or anything, so how can I be sure? The calls weren't as long this time, and I actually timed it on my watch. They lasted for 7 minutes and 38 seconds. None of us said anything the entire time we were listening, and for the longest time after that. Eventually, Terry called to us from the truck and scared the living shit out of me. The three of us yelled at him in whispers to shut up. He wanted to leave, but we were too curious to pack up and go, especially that late at night, in pitch black, in the middle of the woods, where a damn Sasquatch was probably out for an evening stroll. We stayed up, still listening for another hour, but we didn't hear anything else that night. Terry and the girls slept in the truck and begged us to stay with them, but Greg, my brother, and I ended up staying in one of the tents. We were just too damn curious to do anything but sleep in the tent. At sunrise the next morning, we were greeted by a ranger. I'm talking as soon as the sun was rising, that guy was there. He told us we had to leave and that this area was off limits. My brother argued that it was public land and we could camp there. We had our fire permit and everything, and we'd already been there for three days, but the ranger repeated himself that we had to leave. He had this tone to his voice that said we should listen to him unless we wanted trouble. I told John we needed to just pack up and get out of there like the ranger said. The six of us started packing and the ranger never left. He waited there and watched us pack up like it was his personal duty to make sure we left. Another ranger showed up as we were packing and joined the first one, and he too watched us pack up our stuff and load it into the truck. Once everything was loaded, John tried to ask why we suddenly couldn't be there, 
And all the first ranger said to us was, you guys have a nice day and drive safe. That really pissed me off. This guy came into our campsite and passive aggressively threatens us to leave and then doesn't even tell us why, especially after all the scary shit we heard the night before. But not wanting any trouble, I held my tongue and we left. We drove back down the little trail to the main road where we were floored. There were about half a dozen more rangers with their trucks, all staring at us as we drove by. There were also three black vans with dark windows and no plates. Rachel pointed to them and said, someone knows something and doesn't want us to know. I could tell there were people inside the vans, but I couldn't make anything out because the windows were too dark. We drove back down the little trail to the main road and we were floored. There were about half a dozen more rangers with their trucks, all staring at us as we drove by. There were also three black vans with dark windows and no plates. Someone knows something and doesn't want us to know, Rachel said to us. I could tell there were people in the vans, but I couldn't make anything out because the windows were too dark. Let's just get out of here, Greg said as he drove us away from the scene. We didn't talk about it much on the way back. I don't think any of us even really knew what to say. The next day, Greg, John, and I went back to see if we could find anything, but we couldn't even get anywhere close to where we were. One of the road trails was blocked off with a no trespassing barricade across it, and as we were driving towards the other trail on the main road, we started getting followed by a park ranger. We decided not to push our luck and just kept driving through. I've been back there a few times since then. John and I actually go out there once or twice a year, but we've never heard any of the noises or found any traces again. Maybe the rangers ran off whatever it was. Maybe it moved on itself. I wish I could have seen what was making the noises that night. Those noises were not human, and it wasn't any kind of animal that I've ever heard. I firmly now believe that it was a Sasquatch. In fact, I was so inspired by this encounter that I have gone squatching several times now. I've seen one only once, which I also wrote down for you. In closing, yes, these things are real. I can testify that truth myself. Have a good night. Sincerely, Jamie. By 1914, Dr. Silas Ware Mitchell was the leading neurologist in America. He had been president of both the American Neurological Association and the Association of American Physicians. He was also a famous man of letters. One night after a shift at the Philadelphia hospital, Dr. Mitchell relaxed in his bed, ready to fall asleep and recuperate from a long day's work. As he started to drift into a peaceful sleep, his doorbell rang. Unhappily, he kept his eyes closed for several seconds until the doorbell rang a second and a third time. With a sigh, Dr. Mitchell made his way downstairs into the front door. To his surprise, he found a little girl standing on his porch as the snow was beginning to fall behind her. He stared at her for a moment, wondering why such a young girl would be out in the cold, alone, with nothing more than a thin dress and an old shawl to keep her warm. Please help me, doctor. My mom is very ill. He hesitated, but when the girl's eyes welled up and she asked a second time, he sighed and invited her in while he gathered his things and got ready. The girl nodded in the direction of her home, and Dr. Mitchell followed. They silently made their way to her home. Upon arriving, Dr. Mitchell found the mother stricken with a severe case of pneumonia. He started to treat her and spent the next hour tending to her. When he told her he admired her daughter's determination, the woman looked at him in disbelief. My daughter died last month, she told him. She motioned to a cupboard. I keep her shawl close to me. It makes me feel better. A chill ran down Dr. Mitchell's spine. He hadn't seen the girl since arriving. He went to the cupboard and pulled out the same shawl he'd seen the girl wearing just an hour before. There were no signs that it had ever been out in the cold. A famous English diplomat named Lord Dufferin had a paranormal experience that ended up saving his life. While in Ireland, he stayed with a friend, and one night, a case of insomnia troubled him. At one point in the night, he started feeling a looming uneasiness in the air, 
and went to look out of his window. With the full moon high in the sky, it was easy to see the grounds of the house. The night was still and silent. When he started hearing a moaning noise, he brushed it off and thought it was his imagination. But then he heard it again. Still, he brushed it off, thinking to himself that it had to be the wind. As the moaning grew louder, he realized it wasn't his imagination. That's when he noticed movement near a line of trees. As he watched the shadows, the moaning was joined by a heavy panting, and a short man appeared from the shadows. On his back was a long black box. The weight of it was what was causing the moaning and the panting. Lord Dufferin ran from his room and bolted out onto the lawn. As the moonlight caught the man, Lord Dufferin realized what the box was. It was a coffin. When Lord Dufferin called out to the man, he turned to face him. The man, if that's what you want to call it, was the ugliest, most evil-looking man that the Lord Dufferin had ever seen. Unnerved but determined, Lord Dufferin confronted him, thinking him as a grave robber. The man didn't answer. He only stared. Lord Dufferin took a few steps closer, and the man in the coffin disappeared into thin air. Now confused and understandably frightened, he looked around on the grass for footprints or any signs of the casket-carrying troll, but he found nothing. He quickly went back to his room and wrote down everything he'd just witnessed so he wouldn't forget any details. As the years passed, he pushed the incident to the back of his mind, and he went on to be the English ambassador to Italy and Russia. He was also the Governor General of Canada, and finally, in 1891, the ambassador to France. He traveled to Paris and stayed at the Grand Hotel. One day, he waited at the elevator among a group of people. As the door opened, he began to enter, but froze in horror, because the elevator operator was the same impish man he'd seen carrying the coffin. Lord Dufferin remained calm and backed out of the elevator. The rest of the people waiting entered instead. He rushed to the hotel office, eager to learn the elevator operator's identity, but before he could make it to the office, he heard a loud crash that rocked the hotel. A cable had broken on the very elevator he had refused to board, and plunged five stories, killing everyone on board. Lord Dufferin used his position as ambassador to investigate the crash. He employed the secret services of both England and France, but the identity of the operator was never found. On the morning of February 9, 1885, residents of the quiet village of Devonshire woke to what appeared to be another cheerful day with freshly fallen snow. It was what they found in the snow that would soon invoke fear, panic, and the belief that the devil himself had come to visit during the night. Early that morning, Henry Pilk of Topsham was the first to find the unusual footprints in the snow that passed across his yard. Each print was the shape of a U, as if made by a horse. Stranger still was that they were in a line, one after the other, instead of side by side like they should be. Soon the entire village had noticed the same hoof print all over the village, and they tried to catch a glimpse of whatever it was that was making the tracks. Curiosity soon turned into unease and eventually fear as the tracks went on for miles and miles, sometimes leading right up to stone walls over ten feet high and picking up right on the other side like no wall was even there. The size of the prints never changed, from four inches by two and a half inches, and they were always spaced eight inches apart. The footprints never doubled back even though they went up to every single house in town and the prince went as far as 96 miles south of Topsham in only six hours. The prints were found everywhere, in the woods, on rooftops, on main streets, in cemeteries, even leading up to the X River and picking up right back on the other side, always eight inches apart, always four by two and a half inches. Trackers said the beast never even appeared to have rested. After the snow melted, the U-shape took on the shape of a cloven hoof. Villagers from all over said it was the devil himself. The villagers hid in their houses, locked their doors, 
kept their children quiet and prayed to God that whatever beast made the tracks didn't return. Hunters tried to track the beast with their dogs, carrying their guns and anything else that might be used against the devil, but nothing was ever found. With the next snowstorm, the tracks were covered and no new tracks ever appeared.